to introduce the moderator for, for the next uh, panel. Uh, the moderator is Dr. Asim Padella, uh, who is the director both of the program of medicine and religion and also the Divinity School's initiative on Islam and medicine here, here at the university. Dr. Padella is an associate professor of medicine in the section of emergency medicine and a faculty member at the McLean Center. Uh, Dr. Padella's work as a, a clinical researcher and a bioethicist has focused on improving healthcare outcomes and experiences in the American Muslim community. He's developed methods for designing community-based healthcare interventions and hospital policy accommodations. Additionally, uh, Dr. Padella has collaborated with Islamic study, study scholars and with institutes worldwide to analyze how moral reasoning and scientific data uh, concerning modern biomedicine interact with traditional Islamic frameworks. Today, Dr. Padella will be the panel's moderator, and he will be, um, we're changing the order a little bit, he will be the first speaker um, on the panel, and the topic that he will talk about is Muslim conception of motherhood, gestational surrogacy, and uterine transplantation at issue. Please join me in giving a warm welcome, Dr. Asim Padella. Thank you so much, Mark, for that kind introduction. It's really an honor every year to be here amongst the faculty, amongst what I think is a community uh, of scholars who you have to respond. So again, thank you, Mark, for giving us this opportunity. So as you heard of my title, I'm going to talk about this. But to set that up, I want to talk a little bit about what I've been doing for many years, right, in this conversation of how religion is part or not part of bioethics discourse. And so this has been a perennial conversation. You all know about this. I've presented you many times around this. This is just one special issue of a journal that myself and others in the audience actually are on the editorial board for. And so we talk about these issues of how religion belongs or doesn't belong. And most recently, there was a, uh, an editorial about whether or not we should publish religiously derived opinion pieces on ethical issues. This is from the Developing World of Bioethics Journal. Because the question was whether this is part or parcel of public reason-based dialogue or not. Um, obviously, as any scholar, my, my mentee and postdoc was also part of this presentation, Rosie, and I wrote this article in rebuttal to that, thinking about, well, why not? I set that up because I'm going to share with you a model of thinking about why I'm going to talk about from a lens of Muslim patient ideas as well as from Islamic scholars thinking about motherhood. When we as ethicists think about morally assessing biotechnology, we do these things more or less. Right? We think about the implications and ramifications of that technology. Largely the harms and benefits to individuals and societies in many different ways. Right? We think about the biomedical science involved. Often we think about the origin of that, the implications of that are outside, but what's the origin? So for example, a classic example would be about data on hypothermia from Nazi Germany. Right? So we think about the origin in some ways of the biomedical science or the technology, where does it come from? And we also sometimes, less often, think about the nature and essence of the object acted upon by that technology. Right? And by this I mean the ontologies of what that thing is, the values attributed to that thing, or that person, or that being, or that, uh, that intervention by society, by individuals, and the meanings it has. Right? This is how we think about or analyze moral uh, biotechnology from an ethical perspective. Now there's no reason, I think, and I'll argue, that religious frameworks can't be part of that conversation. So here, religious frameworks help us think about ontologies to provide values and meanings to things. Right? And particularly in this case, and what I'm going to present, how Islamic scholars and texts from that tradition think about the value and meaning and the ontology of motherhood. On the other end, there's no reason why Muslim or religious communities should not offer a sense of how harms and risks are weighed for their community. Right? How religious values are under attack or not under attack, or their identity is at issue or not. So in the work that I do, I think about, okay, the ontologies and the religious values from a religious lens, just so for a way of us thinking about bioethical issues. So for me, it's not a question whether religion is part of bioethical discourse. I think they're together. They have to be if we're going to do justice to the society and the people that we live around. So in any case, today, 
and we need to present some empirical data on attitudes towards assisted reproductive technologies and motherhood, largely drawn from moss space samples in Chicago and DC. This is work that I've been doing for several years. Then I'm going to detail Islamic biophysical judgments on specifically urine transplantation and surrogacy. And yes, I'll give you disclosure, this is selected fat fatwa hunting. I'm going to only present views from the Sunni world and these juridical academies that bring together physicians and scholars for certain reasons. In Q&A, you can ask me why I selected those only. And I'm going to share with you some of the dominant scriptural understandings of why or why not certain things are permissible or not permissible. In the end, I hope that sort of case example will help us think about and critically analyze the constructions of motherhood, right? What bonds are privileged when we think about producing parenthood? And how do scientific and social imaginaries interact in that production of motherhood or parenthood by biomedicine? So what's the challenge? And I think you all know this, that fertility rates are dropping everywhere in the world, right? It's not just a phenomenon in the developed world or the developing world, everywhere, right? And there are many causes for that. Some are lifestyle choices. Smoking is a big contributor to infertility in both men and women. We know that there are issues of sperm motility challenges that affect men. There are issues with uterine abnormalities that affect women. So there are other causes as well. But this is a multifactorial issue which has led to a fertility decline across the world. Now, for the Muslim community, this has also led to some interventions. That's kind of the way I got into this work. This is a mentee of mine at Drexel. She's doing a psychosocial, spiritual intervention around depression in women who have not been able to have a child as a way of improving fertility rates. Right. That's the work that she's doing. Um, and the other way, this is across the pond, you know, there's ideas, for example, in Lebanon, this is Marsha Inhorn's work around what fatherhood means. So if you're not able to have a child, is fatherhood under attack? Or when you're thinking about getting married, given the uh, way that fertility rates are declining, should you also have some funds to allow for IVF in that society as part of your marriage sort of contract, right? So the masculinity is under challenge in certain ways as well and across the pond. In any case, to solve all these problems, biomedicine comes in, right? And there are many ways that we can solve, or clinical infertility at least, perhaps, by producing what I call parenthood links, right? And these can be from genetic parenthood links through the artificial insemination, IVF, right? Through all the way through social bonds, right? We can kind of think about how gestational surrogacy works or doesn't work. And there are some ideas around whether or not adoption and fostering is part or parcel of intervening upon the social determinants of health for the issue of clinical infertility. Right? So in any case, this is how we produce parenthood, or some ways. Now, coming down the pike, you've heard about this in bioethics terms as well, the ideas about human reproduction through cloning, right? We already do that for dogs and movie stars in Hollywood. There's no reason why we can't necessarily do that, right, in the coming years for humans uh, at the University of Chicago, perhaps. Um, and the other idea is about creating synthetic gametes, right? For couples who are not able to reproduce, quote unquote, naturally, perhaps we can denucleate sperm and put it in a donor ova, and therefore you can now have a same sex couple having a child through synthetic gamete production. Again, the science is not too far off. So these are things that are coming down the pike, but I'm not going to talk about them. I just want to spend time talking about uterus transplantation and gestational surrogacy here in this presentation. All right, so now let's kind of take a journey through how Muslim communities think about these sorts of things. I mentioned to you that I do empirical work in mosque communities. This is data from four mosques uh, within Chicago and DC, where we were doing rigidly tailored RNRCT actually on organ donation and end of life care. And before being in, uh, right at the first session, we had a survey. In that survey, there were attitudes around RERT that we included. These questions, I'll share some with you. But for the purposes of you analyzing the implications of the data, you should know this is adult males and females, right, who have had no experience with organ donation or transplantation, and they're fluent in English. So I only use an English based survey. So here is one sort of uh, panel of that survey asking about reproductive health. We asked, according to your perspective, rank you know, which of these four things define motherhood for you on a rank order scale. Sharing genetic material, the act of bearing someone, right, pregnancy and delivery, breastfeeding, or raising the child. Which is the most important, and you would rate that. And then we said, imagine yourself as part of a healthy, happy marriage Right? and you were afflicted with something, now you have to pursue an option of treatment, and all of these are efficacious. How do you think about IVF? Are you comfortable with that egg donation? And so on and so forth. So this is what we got out of that survey. We had 158 people, 
there are about equal number of male and women participants, uh, largely a South Asian sample based on the mosque that we went to, largely individuals who are not born here. However, they've been here in the States a long time, right? You see greater than 15 years, 82% of the sample. And there is largely a Sunni mosque, and there's a reason why uh, in the discussion I'll talk about why Sunni mosques and their views are different than Shi, Shi mosques. So this is social demographics. Obviously, I went to mosques, so you can imagine that the ratings of religiosity were very high amongst this group. So I won't go through that, but they're a very religious group. So what do they think about motherhood? This is what came out of that first question. Right? So what do you think is the primary, the number one determinant of motherhood? And you see here that the response is we're raising the child is perhaps the most common amongst the group, right? Number one, 38 percent. But gen sharing genetic material or the act of gestating a child was also not far behind, 28 percent. The idea of breastfeeding was a minority view, or very few people thought this was the determinant, number one. But you should know that in the Islamic tradition, there's an idea of milk motherhood, right? Milk kinship. So this was something that we put into the survey. So anyway, you see that. Now thinking about the treatments I proposed, let's talk about gestational surrogacy. So you all know in gestational surrogacy, genetic links are maintained, right? The, the progenitor of the ovum and of the sperm are the married, or not married, but the, the couple that wants to have a child. And then you involve a gestational uh, uh, individual, uh, person to be a gestational carrier for that child. So genetics are fine, right? But it involves a third party. And so you see here the group uh, these participants were not very comfortable, right? overwhelmingly not comfortable with the idea of gestational surrogacy. Now, in uterus transplantation, genetics is not an issue, neither is gestation. Right? You have a donor who's given a uterus, and so those are preserved. Yet you see, again, maybe a little less significant, but there's uncomfortability around this idea as well as a solution to not having a child. So then we said in that survey, we also asked, what about this idea, right? I would choose not to have children. Not those four options, just not have a child. Then, again here, people are uncomfortable with not having a child. Yeah? All right. So what's the summary? So I showed you the uncomfortability data, right? Not, uncom not comfortable with uterus transplantation, not comfortable with gestational surrogacy, not comfortable not having children, by and large. And if you did predictive associations, right? I didn't share that table with you, but you'd see that individuals who are not comfortable with having, not having children were also not comfortable with not, uh, with, with not doing, I'm sorry, with doing uterus transplantation and surrogacy. So these sort of trended together. And what was obviously interesting in this sample that's highly skewed, those are more religious, right? They were particularly not comfortable with the idea of uterus transplantation, all right, amongst all the other uh, associations. So that's the data about meanings and values from the Muslim perspective sociologically. Let's think about how scholars, or let me present to you how scholars think about this issue as well. Okay. So first, uh, just as a caveat, you know, we should know that, that uh, there are many things in Islam, but the importance of the family unit is really central. Um, the idea that you are a community that is, uh, uh, the idea of relatedness is drawn from this idea of, of a, a nuclear family, then you have rights and responsibilities there, then you have extended family to then tribes, nations, peoples, communities, right? So it just goes out like that in concentric circles. And we have actually manuals that talk about the rights that your neighbor has that's seven doors away. Right, upon you as a community. So it's a big, important thing within the Islamic tradition. Now, when you think about uh, the higher objectives of Islamic law, the term is maqas al sharia, which takes human interests and reflect them into moral ends for law, um, then there are also three central or essential objectives that are located, the locus of that is in the family. One is the preservation of lineage, the preservation of progeny, and even the preservation of wealth, which comes, inheritance goes through family structures, right? In the Quran, there's a distributed shares for each person, how closely they're related to you. These all are part of the family. Now you should know that scholars say there are six total essential objectives. Three of them are part and parcel of the notion of the family unit, right? So it's really, really important to think about. So let's think about options. I like the fact that you know, John Lantus mentioned this idea of going to spiritual healer and this idea of an ontology of healing within traditions. So I can't talk about those treatments until I talk about the idea of how healing occurs or how Muslims think or Muslim scholars think about healing. So you have examples about treating infertility in the Quran. Um, one of the, the first verse, now I can't point all the way up there. Can I? 
Yeah, maybe. So this verse talks about uh, the idea that for God is the heaven, dominion of the heavens and the earth. He creates whom he wills. He gives as a gift uh, to those to some children, those children being men and women, uh, and for some of them pairs, right? Men and women, male and female child. The important verse, part of the verse is right here. And he makes some aqim, barren. He is all-knowing and all-capable. So this idea that there are people who are always going to be a part of the normal bell curve who are infertile, and this is part of God's plan. And then you have stories in the Quran, this is of, of, of Yahya, who in English you would say is John, that says he was wanting a child, an inheritor, and we responded to him, how? We made correct or perfect or bettered or, or made whole his wife, who was barren. So just in response to prayer, you have this idea of divine intervention. So this then leads to the idea that theology correlates with law, that seeking treatment for infertility is not obligatory. If you leave it off, it's okay, you're not sinful, because some people are not going to be fertile, or they're going to be left barren. So that's the idea of infertility. So let's talk about gestational surrogacy for a second. So the ruling is, and I put that term you all know, I'm sure, haram, yeah? uh, impermissible by Islamic law. This is how Sunni scholars think about it. And you know the, the, how gestational surrogacy works. And the reason they give is confusion of lineage, both of who the mother is and who the father is. So as for the mother, uh, the reason they go back to this is another verse in the Quran. Uh, it says here, it's, I'll give you the context if you want in the Q&A, but those of, you who can be, those of you who can claim the title of mother in Ummahatum illallahi wladnahum are those who bore you and birthed you. That is the definition. The Arabic is very strong there. Uh, that that is who a mother is. That's the label that you get attached to. So now in gestational surrogacy, the woman who is born and gestate a child is the mother. Right? Based on this verse. And then, what about the father? So there's a saying from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon that says, uh, that the child is for the bedspread. Meaning what? That when you have an illicit marriage, you don't inquire about who's the father and who's the mother. It is for that, if there's a legal marriage, that child is attributed to those parents. That's it. You don't inquire, stability of society is more important, that's the deal. So if there's a known marriage, you stop there. So now, who would be the father? The father is the husband of the gestational carrier because there's illicit marriage, perhaps, and that would be the father. So this is gestational surrogacy, right? Um, where we would think genetics are preserved, but you see how scholars now are, are having other ideas of parenthood. Let's take uterus transplantation example here. So just to preface, right, the idea of, uterus, of organ transplantation in the Islamic tradition, uh, scholars say that if it's life-saving, it becomes obligatory, otherwise it's permissible, and in some cases it is impermissible. So when you talk about sex organs, the scholars sort of say that it's haram, it's impermissible, and the way they go about this is that they talk about the idea that it contains genes, genes pass on heredity, and then therefore you'll have confusion of lineage. So you can't donate ova and sperm, or testes and, 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 and tubes. Now, as far as the uterus, an interesting argument comes about in the scholarly paradigm. I'm not saying this is all scholars, but there's a group that talks about this, that there's a metaphysical reality attached to the uterus. And what is that? Again, you go back to the scripts, and they sort of say, and I'm going to kind of go through this entire verse, uh, O mankind, fear or be conscious of your Lord that created you from one soul and created for it its mate, and made from them many men right, and many women. So all mankind comes out from that. And be mindful, fearful, be conscious of God, right? The one who you ask your rights from, and Khan, and the womb. So there are other sayings of the Prophet, the idea that the womb is going to ask, did you cut relations off with me? Meaning you didn't talk to your parents or brothers or sisters or children in the afterlife. That will demand rights and that you'll be sinful for not completing the rights of the womb. So they say, okay, we have some question about whether or not uterus transportation is okay. Now, you're going to tell me that in Saudi Arabia they allow uterus transportation. That's true. But I'm just telling you that there is another dominant view that this is, might not be permissible. Now to an interesting case. When I presented this in, in a Muslim context, you know, people understood it. But I just want to say it's not just a Muslim context. There are many contexts where there are polygamous marriages, right? Here is from the States. This is a Filipino uh, soap opera. And so there was an interesting case presented to a FIC council in 1984, 1985 about this idea of gestational surrogacy within two wives of the same husband. 
so I know my time's ending here. The idea here was that they first said this is permissible because there's no confusion who the father is, because it's legally embedded, right? And we will just assign the rank of a milk mother to the gestational carrier, we're fine. Then the year after they said, no, we can't do this because the scientists came and presented data that perhaps you don't know which ova is it the don't, is it the, the which, which, which ova is part of that embryo. It's possibly there's a miscarriage and then therefore that it's actually of the mother who was gestating. So they said, if there's any doubt there, then we can't allow this procedure. Okay. So now, close to ending, and then we're going to have a, perhaps a conversation. So let's attach names to people. So you have Fatima and Mustafa as the people who want to have a child. You have Amira, who's the individual who is the donor of the uterus that now Fatima has. And you have Jannah and Barak, who are the, uh, the, 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 the married couple that Jannah is the one who's going to have to be the surrogate. So the contestations are like this, right? That the issue here with gestational surrogacy is that Jannah is involved. Right, that she's potentially a mother, that she potentially has a husband, therefore we can't allow this. For the idea of two wives, the issue is that perhaps Jenna is the one who gave the ova, right? so we can't allow this. And then if you think about uterus translation, then there's no problem within gestational or, or, or genetic or rearing roles, but there's some issue of afterlife ramifications, perhaps. So what do we see here when you combine the data from the, uh, from the community as well as from the scholars? That all groups, Right, scholars and laity agree that motherhood or see motherhood as a composite of genetic relationships, gestational relationships, and rearing relationships. That these have to come together to assign the notion of parenthood. And in this case, I'm talking about motherhood. Yet, you know, as you can imagine, scholars want to update their sort of metaphysics and think about their law. So genetic science read into Islamic law, I would argue, perhaps this was not the best thing. Right? Maybe it was a positive development, maybe it wasn't. Why? Because we can't fully privilege genetic bonds, as you see. Right? And I mentioned, I'll tell you what the Shias do. So the dominant tradition, the Shia tradition, says genetics equals parent. Right? So they're able to move away. And so these things are permissible, but then they have to work out how you deal with the ideas of who you can marry and not marry, inheritance and everything else. But they just take the genetic vote fully. Sunni scholars don't. Lastly, this issue, right? So now we want to use this data to counsel Muslims. Well, Muslims don't want to be childless either. But there's no acceptable biomedical solution that maintains these three sort of linkages, right? And doesn't also implicate afterlife bonds. So I would say we don't yet have a solution that would meet all parties' needs. Perhaps adoption and fostering, but then I said to you, if we think this is a problem, are we going to be interacting with those social determinants of, say, for example, depression? Are we or are we not as a healthcare system? All right, so I'll end with this slide. I mentioned to you this is the way that we think about, or I think about, how we assess moral assessment, uh, how we assess biotechnology, harms and benefits. From the data I presented, there's an issue about lineage confusion versus having children. Right? Benefit, harm. In terms of the origin of the biomedical science, one of the things I present to you is this issue of whether the donor of that uterus is now a parent. That will, their uterus will ask about rights on the day of judgment. And lastly, when the scholars are talking, what constitutes motherhood, what constitutes a child? So these are all things that we have to deal with as we think about interventions and policy with solutions in our society. I'll end there. Thank you. Okay, one or two questions. Yes. No, so because they dealt with that, but you can't have egg donors, right? So the ovaries are an issue of, well, there are eggs that are contained within the ovaries, and that leads to genetic bonds. But when you specifically talked about the uterus itself, the thing that is just dating the child, that is going to give nourishment to the child, will it then demand rights in the afterlife that that child didn't recognize who I was? Yeah. Uh, One more qu any questions? Yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Nice talk, enjoyed it. Um, so um, I, I'm curious about, um, you surveyed people and you asked about their discomfort, and, and the discomfort seemed to correlate with the level of religiosity. But uh, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with, it, with using discomfort as, as, a, as a, a surrogate for like real, being um, informed by religiosity. Yeah. So, I mean, discomfort can come from a lot of different things as well, right? Yeah. I mean, un, unfamiliarity, um, things like that. 
Yeah, yeah, so actually this, so I, I'm part of the, Part of the reason I'm leaving today is I'm presenting this larger data to a to UNESCO conference in, in Morocco t tomorrow. And the question is, are the relationships between these based on scholars thinking or scholars thinking, right, meaning scholars have taught communities that's why they're uncomfortable, or is the idea that they're uncomfortable, so now we should think about how scholars think about it, right? What's the relationship? So only one point was related to religiosity, that was uterus transplantation. And I interpreted that because uterus tra transplantation in general is plurality within scholars. Some say you can't do it. But all the other relationships had nothing to do with religiosity, which is my point. Is there something else going on? It's not that scholars say something and then people believe. That's not how it works. So that's what I'm going to present there. Nice. Thank, thank you. you. With that, we'll end. Thank you all, and I'll introduce the next speaker. So, <clears throat> so our next speaker is all known. Well, I should give this. Yeah, let me give this to you, please.